Well, why don't we go ahead and start? I'll, I'll just give some introductions. Um, again, welcome everyone out to our monthly DevOps meetup. We try to do this every Wednesday, every second Wednesday of the month. Uh, we start in January. We're going to try to do that throughout the year. Since we can't meet in person with the with COVID, we're going to do these Zoom meetings until we can start meeting again. But we uh, we hope everyone's staying safe and uh, we can get through this together. Um, we're always looking for new pre present presenters. So if you've got ideas on things you'd like to present, um, we'd love to hear it. Uh, also, uh, as a, just a service to the community, if, if your company is uh, is hiring, um, let us know. And if you're looking for for employment or new opportunities, uh, let us know as well. We'll try to, to spread the word. We have a pretty large email list, so we send that out uh, and try to, to to serve the community as much as we can. Um, we're uh, tonight. We have Jay Frog uh, is is uh, presenting to us. Uh, Baroque. I hope I pronounced that right. Has a presentation on on influencing without authority uh, about DevOps. An exciting topic. I'm sure most of you have similar problems. I know have I have the same issues uh, in different areas that I work of trying to explain what DevOps is how it can benefit uh, their organization and really revolutionize what, what people are doing in software today and, and in the cloud. So with that, uh, oh, also uh, we're gonna do a raffle at the end. So uh, I'll put in my email address uh, uh, in the chat window. Um, so we'll do a random, we'll randomize the attendees uh, pick some names and 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 uh, raffle off some swag, and then I'll if you can send me your address, we'll make sure that that gets shipped to you. So, with that, I'll turn the time over to Roke. Thank you. Uh, thank you, thank you, Brad, for the intro. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Uh, well, I mean, we are sixteen people by now. That's very high attendance those days. I mean, it's it's brutal, and I appreciate each and every one of you for for taking the time and and being here. Uh, so, without further ado, I want to let you off as soon as possible. Let me share my screen, and we will talk about influencing for DevOps without authority. Uh, that would be. Uh, let me just find the right one. Yep, that will be this one. Okay. All right, I hope you see my slides. I can see you all on the other screen. If you want to turn your camera so we'll better feeling of togetherness, and if not, that's fine as well. In terms of questions, again, if you have any question, Go ahead and ask. I will also have. We'll also do like more official uh, Q and A uh, in the end. So let's just get started. Influencing DevOps without authority: How DevOps engineer, even a DevOps engineer, can help advance real DevOps. We're going to talk about the uh, uh, the name and everything else um, as um, in the talk itself. All right. So uh, let's do it. Uh, let's start with the story. The story starts with Alex. This is Alex. And Alex is a system administrator in a low-tech company, textile industry, Western textile. And uh, as all of us know by now, Alex has a problem. And Alex's problem is exactly what we all used to experience for many, many years. Developers write their code and then they toss it over and they go home. And Alex is stuck with the bill or with the software and need to make sure that it runs in production. Obviously, Alex hates it. It's long nights. It doesn't work. And people blame them for software that doesn't work. All this nice stuff. And Alex looks for a way to solve it. And it looks like they find this way. Evgeny Zhitomirsky, one of the co-founders of GitLab, wrote a great uh, blog post 
back in uh, what it was uh, two years ago. Uh, what is DevOps and how it breaks the silos in software engineering workspace? Amazing. Alex started to Google what DevOps is. It looks like they have another upside. The salaries are 50% higher, which is very, very nice. And what Alex does, what you expect them to do, they get a new job as a DevOps engineer in a system company. And now they start DevOps engineering. What DevOps engineer do? Install Jenkins on desktop computer under the desk to automate the CI, implements DevOps in their own DevOps department, DevOpsing all the way. And, uh, you know, as you might expect, Alex still has the same problem because, you know, calling being system administrator and now calling yourself a DevOps engineer doesn't really change anything. It's still developers throw their code now to a wonderful DevOps department to make sure it runs in production and nothing changes. And then Alex starts to kind of think about what is what is really going on. Uh, I, sorry, I need, oh, here we go. What is really going on? We need collaboration between developers and this DevOps department that Alex is a part of. And it looks like a nice term to have is Dev DevOps. Dev DevOps is what happens with Dev collaborates with DevOps. It's just pretty cool. Um, and uh, well, there is some money in it, like it was money in DevOps. So let's go with Dev DevOps. Well, jokes aside, when Alex realizes there is a problem, they do some reading, and obviously, you know, it starts with Wikipedia. Interesting set of practices. Nice. And then the Phoenix project, the DevOps handbook, that's accelerate. And this is where Alex started to realize that DevOps is not about installing Jenkins or automating the CI. DevOps is actually still having this deep specialization in whatever they do, but collaborating around common goals and common culture. Well, obviously, when Alex researches DevOps, they come across this state of DevOps report. Unfortunately, I think the last one that we ever will see was 2019 because of the changes in the Dora team and everything. But let's take this, for example. And Alex realizes that their organization are low performers. They have um, a huge um, uh, gaps between the releases. Uh, their lead time to changes is horrible. Uh, time to restore service is very slow. And changes failure rate is very high. Uh, but the industry, the industry goes the other direction. The industry accelerates into DevOps from 7% elite group to uh, 2018 to 20%, three times elite uh, cohort in 2019. And Alex starts to think why, why, uh, why organizations adopt DevOps. And the, the obvious reasons are, are all business related. The first one is, well, we have users. Users want features and users want features now. How do you help? And um, our competitors, and that's obviously a business win. Also security, um, reactive security built from three different steps, identify, fix, and deploy. Each and every one of them is critical. Obviously, DevOps helps very much with the deploy stage, and this is very, very important. So this is why organizations move from, uh, uh, from not implementing DevOps into implementing DevOps. It is actually an evolutionary pressure. It's a natural thing. to do. So now Alex knows everything about what DevOps really is and even manages to get themselves into important meetings. And in those meetings, Alex hears the same thing. We must release faster. And then he also hears some ideas like, let's hire more DevOps engineers, or uh, sorry, let's fire all the testers. How firing testers can help? Well, testers are a bottleneck. If we will get rid of them, we will for sure release faster. And, and then Alex goes like, how about implementing real DevOps? And you all know how this meme uh, ends, right? Um, the question is why? 
One of the reasons is that whoever makes the decisions about the methodology and the culture related uh, and culture are very, very up there. And Alex, Alex is right there. Alex is the DevOps engineer. But in the end of the day, Alex finds the way and I'm going to show you exactly that, how a, a system administrator renamed DevOps engineer actually can influence through the entire organization to adapt real DevOps, which is collaboration and culture. So my name is Baruch Sadogurski. This is my real business card because I'm a real chief sticker officer. In another life, when we flew over to meetups, you'll probably get some a lot of stickers from me with all shapes and types of frogs. Um, but I'm also head of DevOps advocacy with JFrog. Uh, we do tools. And it would be only natural to me to tell you how tools are DevOps and you have those DevOps in a box, automated DevOps, DevOps uh, uh, platforms and all this kind of crap. This is a lie. DevOps is not about tools. Tools are extremely important. And this is why we as JFrog succeeding uh, thanks to DevOps. DevOps are not about tools. Tools are important. Take a look at DevOps, uh, JFrog. This is my uh, California disclaimer. I guess Utah might work as well. Um, this is one of the charts in a great uh, book called The Culture Map. If you work in multicultural environments, you have to read this book by Irene Meyer. You can see here cultures compared by emotional expressivity and confrontational. And the most emotionally expressive and confrontational people are from Israel and Russia. And I am from both. So if I offend you in any way during this presentation, I'm not even really sorry. So just deal with it, I guess. Um, the most important slide is this. Um, jfrog.com slash show notes. I prepared a special page for you. You go there, you find the slides. They're already there. The video that I will upload because Brad is recording it. All the links to everything, the books that I already mentioned, and all the 20 books that I'm going to mention in the future, and not only, everything is there, a place to comment, to rate, and a very, very nice raffle. Brad mentioned the raffle. This is it. There are nice prices, t-shirts, and I think Amazon Echo, or maybe not. Is Ari still online? Yeah, Ari is here. Ari, I'm sorry. I completely missed the message when you told me what the price is. No, no problem at all. The actually, so there is a, I was just actually conversing with, um, with Brett. Uh, there is, a, everyone's a winner tonight because uh, anyone that enters the raffle on your show notes page is going to get a t-shirt no matter what. I know, I know. And it's the one, and it's the one Baruch is modeling for us right now. Uh, but there's also going to be one person that's selected uh, to win an Amazon Echo Show uh, 5 on the page as well now i was just telling brett also that we are that's not something we can do live unfortunately it's a you know corporate thing however what we will do is we will have the winner selected it within two business days we will contact the winner and then share it with the whole meetup community on your meetup page i will personally write it there so everyone's a winner tonight if you want to enter um and uh it doesn't put you on a mailing list or anything like that. There is information you can opt in for only if you want to, but it's not something we automatically opt you in for. So it's all about community and we want everyone to be happy. Nice. So here you go. That was Ari who actually helped organizing uh, my presentation here today. So Ari, you're amazing. Thank you very much. Right. So um, show notes page, don't forget, go there. If you forget, it's on the bottom of each and every slide. Super convenient. Also, my Twitter handle is in the bottom of every single slide because you really should follow me. Um, anyway, let's get to business. As I already alluded, there will be a lot of books today. And before you try to influence anyone for anything, you need to know the material. You need to know what you are going to do, what you want to achieve, what are we talking about? And as uh, um, uh, Uncle Lenin used to say, learn and learn and then learn some more. And here are some of the books that help us grasp what DevOps really is, 
there are the usual suspects that I already mentioned, the Phoenix Project, the DevOps Handbook, the Accelerate Book, but also a couple of others. So first of all, interesting book, The Unicorn Project, it's an alternative reality for the Phoenix Project. And you probably know the Phoenix Project and their story, how um, an ops guy invented DevOps and won. Uh, the Unicorn Project is the same setting, the same set of problems, but now the one that comes up with the solution of DevOps is um, a lead developer, Maxine, and she wins with DevOps. So a, a different point of view, very, um, uh, very interesting. Um, another one is side reliability engineering. This is, I guess, what uh, Alex became after retrofitting themselves into uh, the DevOps world, not DevOps engineer. And this is the engineering part of DevOps. Um, another one, um, uh, Liquid Software. Um, one of the co-founders of JFrog, uh, Fred Simon, came up with the concept of continuous updates. Um, it's one of those continuous things that you really should implement. And um, him, the other co-founder, you have Landman, and yours truly were to book about it. Now, if you didn't have enough of the giveaways and the prizes, let me know in Twitter, my DMs are open or LinkedIn or whatever, and I will also ship you the book because this is what we do today just for fun. Um, for peace and IT. Uh, while other books are very important, this book is critical. Mark Schwartz wrote a great book for managers of what DevOps is. If you want to influence managers, this book will give you, like you will just quote the book and go with it because it's exactly that. If that was too much books and you're not into books, there are other forms of getting information, DevOps-ish, uh, the newsletter, the podcast, DevOps Speakeasy podcast. This is ours, JFrog. Uh, there is a lot of material in season one. Now we're restarting season two with Kat Cosgrove as host. Um, videos for any DevOps days ever. And also uh, two types of technology routers, just to be um, you know in the know for the tools and everything. ThoughtWorks technology router and also CNCF technology router. They will give you a lot of insight as well. So you took it all and now you took it in and now you know exactly what DevOps is and you're ready to go. You rush into your boss's office and they go like, nope, nope, uh, yep, no. Nope. Why, what do you do, what's going on? There are many reasons and all the reasons are, are legit and valid and we'll talk about how to deal with them. Maybe people just overload it and they don't have time or capacity to even listen to you. Maybe they will uh, listen to you and say, hey, it's a great idea, let's do it. And then just get distracted with other work. Maybe they never even plan to uh, do what you uh, think it's a good idea and they will just, you know, will be talking no work. In any case, whatever the response is, whatever their intentions are, there is a huge activation energy that needs to be put into cultural change in the organization. And this is very hard. All those will probably uh, uh, kind of uh, push you into quitting the entire thing. And I guess my first message is don't. Change is possible. It's hard, but it's possible. And it's worth investing and trying to achieve. And don't give up. Now, but also don't try to boil the ocean right away just because it's really, really hard. You need to do it methodologically. You need to do it smart. And this talk is about that. We are going, there are a bunch of books and, and uh, different approaches to influencing people. Um, we're going to look today into um, a methodology invented by Alan Cohen and David Bradford, which is called Influence Without Authority. This is a six step model called the Coin Bradford Influence Result Authority Model. And we are going to go step by step over each and every step on the diagram and see what it actually means to give you the ammunition for influence. Let's start with the first one, assume all our potential allies. This is a very simple and very, very potent trick. We trend a lot of time to 
um, judge another people and another teams by what we think about them and cancel our approach even before we do it. We can say, hey, yeah, I know this guy, he will never do it. Oh yeah, I know her, she, she not gonna, I, I won't even approach, she's too busy and all this kind of stuff, don't. Assume that everybody are available, everybody want to help, everybody want to do the right thing and just go with it. This will give you much larger set of people that you can use to influence your entire organization. Now it's so large the set if you don't cancel anyone up front that you really need to make to, to start picking who you will try to ally with. And there are very simple advices on how to pick. First of all, look for forward looking teams. They will probably be more um, uh, uh, willing to try something new and something that is good. Look for highly visible projects. If you succeed with them, then you will be halfway through to convincing everybody else. Uh, well, there are obviously uh, among the, the two, uh, those that only look like forward looking or highly visible. So, you know, beware of some promoting cheaters and those bugs as well. The easiest way to determine the later with the former is just talking to people. And you talk to people and you will find allies, you will find good ones as well. So this is the first one. Don't cancel anyone up front. The second is, okay, now I assume that everybody are, are my friends and will help me to promote uh, my idea. What is exactly my idea? Why am I doing what I'm doing? And obviously in case of DevOps, our goal is to break the silos in all software engineering workspace because this is what the market demands of our organization. It's an evolutionary pressure. And frankly, we also wanna work in a more modern environment, nicer environment, more up-to-date environment, and not like be stuck in the waterfall procedures from 30 years ago. This obviously helps. There is nothing wrong in admitting that this will promote your career. Obviously it will. If you manage to influence your entire organization and adopt real DevOps, that will be <coughs> a huge boost for your career Nothing wrong with that. Once you realize why are you doing that, this is where it's good to start thinking what other people, why other people might want it. So let's talk about who are you going to influence and what is on their mind. So let's start when we left. First of all, obviously promotion of career is not only your desire, it's everybody's and that's absolutely fine. And here comes the interesting twist, the incentives that people want in order to get something done. And they are not what people normally expect. Daniel Pink wrote an amazing book called Drive in which he describes three factors that lead to better performance and personal satisfaction for uh, like, let's say not the, the unskilled labor for um, software engineers, for, for one. And they are autonomy, mastery, and purpose. Autonomy is I can work by myself and you can start thinking how everything here connects to DevOps, right? Mastery is I wanna use the most modern tools possible and purpose, I want to contribute to the purpose of the organization and want to have purpose for my work. It's very, very related to DevOps. And this is why it's so easy when you know how to approach people from different teams in your organization to sway them into DevOps because you provide all of them with all three, this is perfect. Now, what you need to remember is that people are not rational and they are irrational, but they are predictably irrational. Bunch of books on the topics like the predictably irrational by Diana Reilly, um, uh, Sway by the Brufferman's, there are a lot of books of how can you not manipulate, but find the right approach to humans in order to, uh, to convince them to whatever your goal is. What you need to remember is that 
everybody want to do the right thing and everybody want this right thing to last. We can promise a lot of people in our organization a legacy, a legacy of a better software delivery. And this is something that is very, very powerful. Obviously, you need to think about a lot of things that happen in the world of other people. For example, metrics. How are they measured? Maybe their metrics are completely incompliant uh, in with DevOps. And then you need to look for another approach of first changing their metrics and only then they can help. How their boss will react. Maybe they're afraid from the reaction of their boss and they won't do anything for you. Um, will it be interesting for them? Will the transformation make their work more interesting? How it will affect their career? What will be the reaction of their peers? And here, you know, let's, if we automate QA, then manual testers might get worried that they will be automated out of work and whoever promotes this inside their organization, they will uh, kind of get down on, on, on them very hard. Um, maybe they're overloaded and uh, they want to help, but they just don't have any capacity. Maybe they're just in their character. They're not like a helping type. And obviously you need to remember that most of the people do have life out of work. And this obviously can affect if they're going to help you or not. Now, the easiest way to convince someone, especially an engineer, is with numbers and with metrics. And we know those metrics, right? We'll look at the Accelerate book. We'll look at the DevOps report. Here they are, lead time, deployment frequency, change fail, time to restore service. Very, very easy. What our message is, we are taking our organization from here all the way to here, because this is where our legacy is. If we leave the organization in this state, this is our badge of honor. When do you look for those numbers? When do you look for the clues where our organization is and what is the status? So first of all, some organization publish, uh, publish metrics. It can be OKRs, can be other types of metrics, and this is a great place to look for. Um, if you have access to backlogs, you can see, for example, very clearly the lead time from the backlogs. Um, internal presentations, kicks, kickoffs of sorts, quarterly reports, all those will give you clues to where the organization stands in terms of, um, of those numbers. And uh, nothing replaces the water cooler talk that we don't really have today. Hopefully it will come back and we will be able to use it. For now, if you have any less official interaction with people, just ask them, they might tell. And now, as I promised, I'm going to show you how each and every team and team member and function fulfills all the checkboxes of Daniel Spring Drive with DevOps. We're, we're going to do a matrix of all the functions, dev, ops, QA, security, product, uh, whatever, and answer the question, how DevOps helps their autonomy, their mastery, their purpose, and will address their biggest fears from DevOps. I'm not going to do this for all the functions because it will take another hour. I will give you examples and you are more than welcome to do this exercise, fill the entire matrix and see how perfectly it fits. So just a couple of examples. Let's take developer and ask how DevOps helps with their uh, autonomy. Well, obviously, very simple. Developers are now pushing their own software to production. This is autonomy at its best. They see their product all the way through from the code to customers using it. This is autonomy, perfect. Let's take fears. What developers are afraid of when they think about DevOps. Their fear is also very, very clear. They fear that now suddenly the ops part of the house is their job. They need to maintain Kubernetes, whatever it means, 
if there are problems, they need to be awake at 3 a.m. This has never been their job. And now they fear that DevOps will make it their job. And again, we have a way to work with it. And um, in the end of the presentation, I will answer exactly that question. Um, let's look at ops now. Mastery of ops. What is mastery of ops? Obviously, all the modern cloud native stack is um, extreme. Is, is, is mastery of ops taken to extreme? Uh, all the infrastructure is code, Kubernetes, YAML. I mean, that's mastery. Uh, knowing the, intent, the, the intents and everything, very mastery in my book. Um, let's look at QA. Uh, purpose. What the purpose of testers and the QA? In the end of the day, only production quality matters. It means that tests, unit tests, lab tests, whatever, is not serving the purpose of QA. DevOps, hell yes. They are part of the entire journey from code all the way to production. They can see how the production code behaves, and this is fulfilling their purpose. Um, let's take fears of security. Obviously, the fear is loss of control. Uh, everybody now deployed to production. There are security vulnerabilities everywhere. Who is there to blame? The um, InfoSec people. Again, DevOps is uh, helping with that, or DevOps is not that uh, awful because we can build in, uh, uh, bake in um, guardrails and security checks into our pipeline. Jeffrog X-ray, this is where I will manage, uh, I will mention that to get my salary tonight. Um, mastery of product managers. I mean, this is something that, what they have to do with it. They have everything to do with it. Product managers want to experiment. No one knows what the customer wants. The customer doesn't know what the customer wants. All we can do is put something in front of them and see if they like them. The faster we can iterate on those experiments, the better the chances that we'll find what the customer really want and do it the cheapest. How, how uh, DevOps helps? It helps tremendously. We can run those experiments very fast, very cheap, very reliable, and uh, find this answer that the product managers look for. So you see, and we can continue and fill the entire matrix. And as I mentioned, I will let you to do this experiment. But in the end of the day, you are going around and answering questions or, or even preaching about delivery, about customer satisfaction, about quality, about architecture, about security. And this is where this might be a little bit overwhelming because this is where you say, hey, I'm not really into any of those things, maybe except one of them, the delivery. It's, an, um, it's a DevOps meetup anyway. So uh, how, can I, how can I supposed to know everything? Well, the answer is no one knows everything. The people who know all of them are as rare as unicorns farting rainbows. Instead, what we need is to be T-shaped people. And you heard about that. T-shaped people are those who have like the deep leg of the T going into what they know real good. And then they have the head of the T that is going really wide and know a lot and know a bit about a lot of stuff. This is where they know about the quality, the product, the security, and everything else. And today we see a very powerful shift from specialization, deep specialization, to a wide generalization. And this shift exists because generalists are adapting better to the rapid change. And we, we live in a world of rapid change. Um, this is another great book, uh, if the previous weren't enough. The good news are that David Epstein also did a tech talk about uh, the concepts in the book. So that's definitely easier to digest. I recommend all of you at least watching the video, but also reading it. So you invested and uh, tons of time into understanding what other people want and how you motivate them through DevOps and what they're afraid of. The next step is let's find the currencies 
that we are going to use in our inference. What are currencies? Currencies are not obviously money here, but they are different types of things that you can use in order to influence. And they can be different types. They can be inspiration related, task related, position related, relationship related, or person related. And I will give you now a couple of examples of what I mean by that. In the end of the day, we look for stuff that will create the symbiosis that the sharks have with their remora fish between you and the people that you want to influence. So it will be a win-win. And I will give you, as I mentioned, an example for such a currency, maybe a surprising one, but I'm checking all the boxes. And that will be a hackathon. Why hackathon is so good? Because if you organize a hackathon, it gives you a currency in almost any type that I mentioned. Hackathon that you organize is a great inspirational currency because you take people, put them into uh, empowered teams of T-shaped people, and in after a very short period of time, you have working products. This is a tremendous inspiration for DevOps. You just did DevOps and boom, it actually worked. So this is super inspirational. It's also task related because in the end of the day, the outcomes of those hackathons help people fulfill their tasks. So you can um, tailor the projects to help certain people that you will then need their help when you go and advanced uh, DevOps. It's a position related because it can help get people promoted or make them more visible. And again, you get allies by doing that. And obviously it creates great relationships within the teams, which also help. Now your best friend with whoever you spend 24, last 24 hours doing hackathon, and they will do anything for you, including implementing DevOps or helping you push it. So, um, that's that, that kind of, um, of currencies. Now, before we actually go ahead and do something, relationships. Relationships are hard. I don't know how about you. I have mostly enemies, good friends, but, but mostly enemies just because that's who I am. People hate, um, people are dealing with me. And that's a problem because if I don't have a lot of friends, it's very hard for me to use those currencies with them because they don't want to hear from me. So remember that this is the outcome of that. How do you overcome it? Well, you learn how to deal with people. And again, there are tons of literature about dealing with people that can help you having more friends than enemies. And I definitely recommend all of them. Maybe they will help you more than they help me. Um, in any way, it is what it is. You have your set of friends you have your currencies, you know what you are doing, you know what they should do, and this is where the money time, this is where you go and influence through give and take. Give and take sounds fishy, quid pro quo, uh, is it like kind of, you know, some bargain that we manage inside our organization? Is it kosher? Well, there is nothing wrong with that. Exchange can be fair, can be win-win and can promote our goal and the goal of our organization. And there are different types of exchange. There is an influence alignment. If you really manage to convince other people that DevOps is good for them, it's their interest. Here you go, interest alignment. You're interested in DevOps, they're interested in DevOps, great. It can be barter. Remember this project that I uh, made uh, for you during the hackathon? Hey, go ahead, talk to your boss, set up a meeting. I want to talk with him about DevOps. Owning a favor, calling in a favor, this is also perfectly fine. You do nothing wrong. You just exercise your influence. Now, this is the end of the model, and it should be the end of the talk, but it cannot really. It cannot really because if all you did was hearing this talk or even reading the book, 
next time you're going to hear exactly the same answer. And that's because there are barriers to influence that we need to talk about. And barriers come in two ways. There are external barriers, which are out there. You can see them. Remember how it all started when Alex get themselves into a meeting with a super powerful uh, leaders and they were completely cut off um, because the power differentiator is too high. You need to be able to speak with whoever will listen to you, but not higher. Different goals. Obviously, if someone is measured on something which is completely incompatible with DevOps, that will be a problem. And, you know, people just might not want to deal with you. And that's another external part. The more subtle and the more dangerous are the internal barriers. So first of all, lack of experience. Uh, if you just heard this talk and you never exercise this model, you'll probably fail just because you don't have experience with it. So try the same model on other stuff. Uh, influence your kid. Well, you have an authority on influence someone else in your household that you don't have authority to do something that will help everybody. Let's see if that helps. Uh, blinding attitude, and that goes back to the first step. Well, they will probably want even co co collaborate with me, so I won't even start. That obviously a problem. Fear of failing. Oh my God, what will happen if I fail? Will I be shamed? Will I, how do I feel and everything? and fear of reaction. Fear of reaction is a very, very natural one. I'm going to try and turn my organization around, but if I fail, my bosses will come after me and it will be very, very painful. For that, there is a concept called best alternative to negotiated agreement or BETNA. BETNA is what do I do if whatever I try to do fails? It's very good to have a solid BETNA for everything you do. When you do something and it's a big decision, you need to think what happens if that won't work. In our case, the worst case is just not thinking about it and or trying to pretend that nothing happens. Not trying to pretend that nothing happens is best because you will limit yourself in your influence. You'll say, well, I could speak with them, but I won't because I don't have a betna. And you might realize your betna like, okay, I'll probably have to look for another job. But this is a stressful event. And again, you might decide not to influence on your entire potential because you, are, you very well expect that you will have to fulfill this stressful thing of looking for another job. The best bet now I can think about in this, um, uh, in this scenario is having a job offer in your pocket because then you will be at your best trying to influence because if not, we'll just leave you already have it. Well, also remember that it's a, a, a turning around entire organization and adopting DevOps is a long campaign. And there are some wins and some losses. See the entire thing. Last thing before, uh, before we finish is a couple of the most common objections that I hear, that we hear when we actually try to convince for DevOps. And one of them I already mentioned, this is the fear of developers. On-call is not my job. Kubernetes is not my job. Writing YAML is not my job. I don't want to start doing that. How do you answer that? The great, uh, the good questions have answers. Great uh, questions have slides. This is an amazing question because I have another talk about it, a whole talk. It's called DevOps for Developers or maybe Against Them. It's online. If you go to the show notes page, you will see a reference to another show notes page of DevOps for Developers or maybe Against Them. And I go uh, on a run for an hour to answer this simple question, why developers might want to adapt DevOps. Another very common objection is, well, we're fine. We are successful. We are Fortune 500. Everything is great. We don't need this DevOps thing. And obviously, you need to remember that today, uh, companies go uh, out of Fortune 500 uh, 
it's faster than ever. The fact that you are successful now definitely doesn't mean that you will be successful forever, even if you are in a completely not a competitive environment like Equifax was. In the end of the day, it didn't help their um, CEO who uh, fell on their sword when all the um, security um, uh, breach uh, happened, right? So we are fine now is not a good answer. Uh, the most common one by far is, hey, we don't have time for this crap. We have a release coming. We really need to work. And all I can do is say that. I mean, sometimes you need to stop in order to move faster and there is no, no other way around. Another interesting objection is, hey, silos are great. Speci it promotes specialization and we need good specialists. So yeah, no, I, uh, our developers won't waste time in learning what ops are doing because we want this time to be used for them to become better developers. And here the real answer is, hey, none of them work um, in isolation. We have a conveyor of software running from the fingerprints of developers all the way to production. And as Eliyahu Goldratt teaches us in their theory of constraints, if we don't optimize in the bottleneck, we don't optimize at all. And whoever didn't hear about the Liao Gorka or Theory of Constraints, that's my last book for today, I promise. It's called The Goal, and you can consume it as a graphical novel if you are fed up with my books. So The Goal is a book, but it's also a graphical novel. Theory of Constraints, very important for DevOps. DevOps is about implementation of Theory of Constraints. So yeah. Uh, that's this is the answer why specialization in silos is not. And the other one, and this is also like super common, is hey, we cannot move faster. We need to stop. We need to implement uh, checks for compliance, for security, for QA, for whatever con concern of the day is, and we have to do it after the product is ready. This is what the regulators demand. And this is a lie. Well, instead of certifying each and every release, every regulator in the world will be more than happy to certify your pipeline because pipeline certification guarantees that the constraints that they want to be implemented will be implemented in each and every release without them trusting you to check each and every release. Another book, by the way, by Mark Schwartz, it's not even on the slides because enough is enough, but I cannot stop. Uh, the Fine Art of... So I really, really recommend that as well in case you didn't have enough. Um, so yeah, how do we do that? Well, we automate everything and then we can certify the pipeline. Now, I like this image, but I also don't like it. You see how people that leave the conveyor are sad? This is a lie. They are super happy because instead of doing something boring on the assembly line, they are going to do something meaningful. They are going to work with their heads instead of with their hands. And no one will get fired. Whoever wants to adapt to DevOps will just have more meaningful jobs by the definition of Daniel Pink. They will have more, more autonomy, more purpose, more mastery. So they should leave the assembly line really, really happy. And you, as Alex, who managed to transform the entire organization to DevOps, actually becomes a chief information officer, not only in Stern Fabric, but now he is up to a career of chief, informa uh, chief information officer in every uh, organization. And this is something that I wish you all. So just to summarize, um, Coin Bradford um, influence without authority model and be ready 
be ready to work with objections and know your material is what I will leave you with today. Um, I'm AJ Baruch on Twitter. Don't forget to follow. This is DevOps UT. And I think that's the hashtag. I, I mean, it makes sense. So just use it. And if it's not the hashtag, we'll make it a hashtag. And jeffrey.com says show notes. The video, not yet, but will be the slides, all the books and the rest of the links uh, and the raffle t-shirts for everybody and the Amazon Echo Show for the lucky winner. Thank you very much. Thank if you. Have any questions. Yeah, let's, if you have some questions, um, let's open it up for the next uh, five or 10 minutes we've got. Um, you can also post them in the chat uh, if, if that's easier. I got, I got a question real quick. Absolutely. Sure. Um, so uh, my company is not Fortune 500, but it's a very small company. We do have like 100, 100 people, employees, but we do have few teams, um, two teams, uh, development team. But we are currently work uh, as a uh, Scrum uh, work frame uh, framework. But I wanted to bring DevOps again. It's uh, it's a little tough because when, when I'm dealing with stakeholders and bringing that point to them, it's like they wanted to push it back so that because the DevOps engineers cost them a lot of money <laughs> than the developers, that's what they think. But again, um, so even if that to happen, let's say if I propose to the stakeholders that we need, this is emergency or, you know, I could pitch myself and say, hey, we need this um, develop setup mindset within our group here. Uh, what do you think would be a best time frame that in order to, you know, transition from one right now, what's going on to, to the DevOps? How, you know, what do you think would be best idea and how long does it take? Kumar, this is a great question. And I think I, I should have a kind of referred to it more during the talk when I spoke mm -hmm. about what to expect. It's a long process. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, for even for not large organizations, we are talking about months, years in order to change culture. Culture change is not, is not easy. Now you have mm -hmm. a great uh, head start. And this is, mm -hmm. you mentioned that you work agile in Scrum. In the end of the day, what DevOps does is extends the agile approach, not mm -hmm. only within the developer but development, but throughout through all the cycle. In the end of the day, DevOps is agile. It's exactly the same mm -hmm. process, but not only right. for development, but for the whole thing. And the, 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 your, your comment about, hey, DevOps engineers are too expensive, well, you DevOps engineers do not exist, right? They DevOps is about culture and collaboration. What who are expensive are all those service reliability engineers, site reliability engineers, uh, uh, production infrastructure engineers. Yes, of course they are expensive. They are expensive because the level of stress they are dealing with is much higher than everything we know, and that's because when we start releasing faster, we need the engineering ability to support that. Now, the question is, do you want to release faster? Not you personally, but your organization. And if there is a consensus that yes, we want to, the answer, well, it will be too expensive for us to support this growth and pace with engineering workforce. It's kind of, it's, it doesn't make sense. So you actually don't want to release faster. Because if you do, you will have to invest in engineering to support it. And if you say, no, right. we won't invest, that actually means that you don't want to release faster, right? So choose something. Right. And right. so this is, this is a not a valid answer. Those engineers are too expensive. It's, it's, there is nothing you can do with it except of just saying, well, I'm fine with releasing once a quarter and let my competition beat me. to my knees because I don't know how to raise faster than once a quarter. Mm -hmm. Does it make sense? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. I appreciate it.
Are there other questions? I've got I've got a question. It's kind of similar on that line, and uh, and and probably many here at the meeting work for companies that are in the cloud, high tech companies. So DevOps kind of comes naturally to them. But for some of us that work maybe uh, in large, you know, uh, maybe non tech businesses or uh, even governments or or nonprofit organizations, it's hard to even time bring up why DevOps is important, especially if they're highly regulated and maybe they had separation of duties that they've been, been talking about for the last 10 years. And now DevOps is kind of disrupting that whole idea. How do you convince managers and others about breaking that cycle and yet you're still not, you're not compromising on, on security and other things? I can't, for some reason, I can't hear Earl. Can anyone hear or is it just me? I cannot, no. No. What? Oh, you're you back. Hear? You're back now, I think. How about Earl, now? You back? Yes. Yeah, we hear yeah, you. Okay. Yeah. I, my mic just went on mute. Okay, that happened. Um, what, what, I, uh, what I started to say is that my point, the last point, when we spoke about the objections is exactly that. Exactly how do you marry separation of concerns with DevOps? And actually it marries very, very well. As I mentioned, the, um, uh, uh, the regulators will be much, will sleep much better after they audit your pipeline than random audits of your releases here and there. Because if they audit your pipeline, and it does what it says, and it's good, it checks all the boxes in their books, the pipelines, not the release, then there is no problem in running code that is written by developers through this pipeline. And the separation of concerns is there because whoever writes code deploys it to production, but the guardrails, the security gates, the every other possible quality gates are set up by different people. So if I set up the pipeline, but you write the code, we have the exact separation of concern the regulator was intended to have, and yet you still go ahead and publish all the way to production without me being the troll that will stop the release. Hey, hey, hey let's see if you are compliant. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Well, we're, we're about out of time. Does anyone have uh, some last minute questions? If not, so so what JFrog's offered, it's in the it's in the chat. Is everyone here can get a T-shirt? And correct me if I have this wrong, but the link, um, and I could probably post this in in the in the meetup notes. Uh, if you go there, there's a form you can submit. You'll get a T-shirt. And you'll be entered in for the raffle for uh, uh, Amazon Echo, um, and that that's a great prize. So I appreciate that. Uh, and again, um, if uh, if your company is hiring, just message uh, the organizers at the meetup, and we will get it posted uh, in the mailing list. And again, appreciate everyone's time. Thanks, Jay Frog, Ari, and Bro. Thanks, really appreciated the the presentation. It was fantastic. I will. When I get this posted, I'll, I'll put it in the link. And if you want to add it to your JFrog uh, yep. website, that's fine too. The show notes, absolutely. Um, and, yep. And, yep. and one more thing, uh, and one Brett, if you do post uh, the link uh, for the raffle outside of the meetup, it's only for people, the free t shirts for people who attended tonight, just so you know. Absolutely. Yeah. So, okay. The special, the special gift for the special gift for attendees um, and so forth. So, okay, well, I, I won't post it if just everyone if everyone can see it there. Yeah. Sometimes people aren't paying attention to the, the chat, but or if you if lose it, I got really, it written down. And if somebody here tonight says, you know, I don't want to fill out J Frog your form, just send Brett your address and we'll make sure you get a shirt. We're good. We're 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 good with that too. You're not going to be put on any mailing list from us unless you opt in for anything. And you have to and uh, but you know, again, we just want y'all to be happy. 
And uh, we really enjoyed being part of your community tonight. Thank you. Thank you very appreciate much. it. Thank you all. Thanks again, everyone. Uh, we'll see you next month. Thank you. Take care. Thank everyone. you. See ya.